Okay, behind me is my stone yard. Now, because of the fire and how long it takes to actually get anything rebuilt and redone, I haven't done a lot of carving in the last three years. But as you can see, I am ready to start working again. I've made a lot of new pedestals. I've got a lot of my bigger rocks up on the pedestal so they're ready to be put bases on, set up right, to be carved. So it's going to be exciting few years. I retired a couple of years ago, my retirement. I'm more busy now that I don't work than whenever I worked. And I have enough stuff to fill up the rest of my life and not even begin to knock off some of my projects. But these things, these stones which I will talk about, have histories that go back tens of millions, 20 million years. And now they're here, I will carve on them and they will last 20,000 years from now with my artwork on them. That'll be a theme I'll discuss quite frequently in the next part of the tour. <clears throat> Along this wall here is a collection of finished artwork. Some older artwork, a lot of stone pieces along the bottom. All of these tiles were made in 2020 that you're going to see up here. These are in preparation for an installation that I'm putting together, which we will talk about later. So a lot of these, you're going to see them now, but won't be available to view for another four or 5,000 years after a couple of weeks. Down at the bottom here, you're seeing rocks like this one here, which I collected to carve, but the rocks are so interesting in themselves that I'm just going to leave them because I cannot do better than what we see right here. And you're going to see these stubbles here are Kansas fence posts. These are actually pieces of fence posts from Kansas. And then this pinkish rock down there is a piece of Ballarat marble. It's an exotic from California. Now I carve a lot of exotic stones from California since that is where my studio is located. And I carve a lot of rock from Kansas. Interspersed among the stones are some welded pieces. They're um, remnants uh, of other work that I did. I currently don't do any welding and at one point I thought I'd set up a welding shop here but I don't know if I have the time with all the other projects I do. The stones as you're going around here almost all of these are California exotic stones and they come from various quarries or just out in the wilderness where I find them. Sometimes the stones have such wonderful texture that I don't touch it. You know, so this one here, I wanted to expose the beautiful marble underneath, but not touch this. So some of the work is abstract expressionist stone carving. You're going to see some lava rocks in here, granites, the big flower there is a ceramic piece. You're going to see sandstones marble here and then of course across the background are ceramic pieces. This is a rogue gallery of all the people I've met here in the Antelope Valley and their odd characters but these are just quick quick studies that I've done and it makes for a very nice little montage there. Now these masks here I've been making masks almost all of my career as a ceramist. My graduate show way back when I was young, I don't think we have numbers to describe that many years ago, I made like 1,500 different ceramic heads and that was my show. And I lined them up in the gallery. So the top heads were looking down, the middle heads were looking straight, the bottom heads were looking up. So no matter where you stood in there, you were being spied on by these 1,500 ceramic heads. And some of these rocks, well, I will never do anything but leave them. There are two pieces of petrified wood here. These are actual tree stumps. I acquired those in Arizona. And, you know, at one point I thought I might want to carve them, but I can't do better than them anyways. This is a piece of lava. This got highly damaged in my fire, but it used to sweep up, so it looked like a wave cresting. Now, I want to talk about this tile, this tile, this tile specifically. These are early on in this process, and I'm 
mainly painting with iron oxide on commercial tiles. These were not highly saturated, and so as I fired it up, it kind of burnt out. These remind me so much of like when you wake up from a dream. You've got these vague images that are ephemeral and pretty soon disappear. Now these aren't going to disappear. 10,000 years from now, this is going to look like this. You know, Ceramic may break, but it'll be ceramic forever. And so, you know, I actually really like these three pieces here because of they're very different. They weren't what I was hoping to achieve because they're they're leaving, you know, they're like the images in your head that are leaving you. And that's how this came out. So I found that quite intriguing. If you look at others, these are quite distinct. Here you've got to actually look at them and try and figure out what images were there. Now we're in my stone yard proper where the big guys are. Now, this stone here, the stone there, and the stone down here, and we'll talk about each of these in a minute, are called henna limestone. I bought these from a dealer in Vancouver, Canada, and had them shipped down here. They're a fun stone to carve because they're not that hard. They're not carved by a lot of carvers because they're very dirty and create a lot of dust, and the dust has um, oxides in it, so it is kind of a toxic dust. But my studio is out in the Antelope Valley. We get winds through here. It is not uncommon to have 50 mile an hour winds, even up to 80 mile an hour winds through here. So it doesn't matter that they're dusty. It, it goes away, it blows away. So you know, I'm fortunate that I can work in whatever stones I choose to work in. I call these guys the guardians. Now they're gonna be moved here pretty soon and be part of the entrance to my gallery over on the other side. Specifically that guy and that guy, the two tall ones. So you know, hopefully gonna have them moved next weekend. But I have to have equipment. To give you an idea, these stones here probably weigh about 1,500 pounds. The red in here is iron oxide. The squiggles are fossils. This is full of microfossils. This was originally dirt, had animals living in them. They died, captured in the dirt. The dirt was turned to marble. Uh, marble. Then as water goes through or whatever, iron oxide is left in this. And so this is iron oxide. One of the reasons why people don't like to carve this, because it kicks iron oxide up into the air. On all of my ceramic pieces I'm doing right now, the tile pieces, I'm using mainly iron oxide with a little bit of glaze in it to help it flux to do the drawing. It's a very cheap and very durable chemical to use in ceramics. Now, like on the paintings, I was describing the layers of sexual imagery. These are distinctly female images, at least on this side. There are male images built into them around the other sides. Now, <clears throat> these exaggerated vaginal areas are reminiscent for me of Mesoamerican art of the cave because they have the mythology and religion that life emerged out of the earth through a cave. And you'll see a lot of sculptures there where they actually have the cave carved in and something inside of it. So this is more of life and the emergence of life. And you know, this is a theme that is ubiquitous in my artwork. We are an animal driven by innate or by instincts. And Everything we do is predicated upon those instincts. We think we're very evolved, but even our highest cultural items are still driven by these same forces that, you know, drive the mosquito to bite us. You know, the mosquito is biting us. It's a female mosquito getting a blood meal for their babies. They're not eating us. The babies are being nurtured by that. This force is everywhere. And it drives us and it drives 
all small creatures, everything. All right, this stone here is a New Mexico travertine. This is a precipitate. What that means is that water came into the area where this dirt was, filtered in, left mineral deposits. And so this is all water deposits, creating this rich texture on here. Now this particular deposit is about 15 to 20 million years old, and it's in New Mexico. In the 1950s, a builder from Utah needed travertine for a house he was going to build. So he got the quarry and started harvesting the travertine. And then it became a commercial quarry for travertine also. Probably about 10, 12 years ago, the Art City Studios in Ventura bought this stone to sell to their carvers. I bought it. So this stone here has a journey that started 20 million years ago. Now it came to me and it sat here. This stone is heavy. This stone probably weighs 7,000 pounds. It tilted a 10,000 pound forklift that was cantilevered over. So those of you who are future stone carvers, you get professionals to move stones like this. Don't do it yourself. You could die. If this stone fell on you, it's not going to hurt the stone at all. Period. Anyways, the imagery. You have all of these faces carved into it, and then sexual imagery, both male and female, going to, to the top. So this is a totem pole type image. Now, we are here in the Antelope Valley. This stone is not going to have a lot of erosion on it, because we don't get a lot of precipitation. It's dry most of the time. So this imagery, unless this ends up in a riverbed or atomic bomb, melts it will be like this 10,000 years from now. So you can imagine this yard right now, say 4,000 years in the future. And the earth has recovered from the apocalyptic wars and GMO and all this stuff. And a band of hunters comes through here. They're harvesting whatever the descendants of cows are. And they stop here in the evening and they start dressing up their kill and packaging it, take it home. And they're seeing all these stones around here. And they're thinking, man, what was this place? They're gonna look at this and they're gonna, they're gonna recognize this imagery because these are humans just like us, just 4,000 years from now. And they're gonna understand, oh yes, this is what I'm here hunting so I can take this meat back to Betty Joe and our five kids, you know? This is what this imagery is like here, or this is what this imagery is about. You know, they're going to be, of course, it's going to be mysterious what was happening here, you know, and always we go to ceremonial sites instead of, oh, this is just some goofy guy in Quartz Hill in 2020 Stone Yard, but um, they won't know that. Okay, let's go back up to... 4,000 years in the future, our hunters are here and they're all dusty and dirty. It starts to rain and they're just passing. Oh, thank God, you know, so dry here. <laughs> and so what they're going to see once this gets wet is this. And as you can see, the water just makes this thing shine. And they're going to be more amazed when they look at this. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, isn't that <laughs> All right, this stone here that our future hunters may find and they might try and pick it up, but they won't be able to. The stone here weighs over a thousand pounds. It is travertine also, so this stone started its life probably some 20 million years ago. This is a very beautiful stone, and I just made it a single head here. 
and you know it has a very nice presence on itself. Now we forget that stones were once dirt and they're from the earth. Now back here you can see some of the exterior surface of the stone. Now here are the quarry marks where this was pulled out of the quarry. They drilled through here, busted this off. There's saw marks on it, which is what I carved. But I find it really cool that these things have a journey that go from millions of years ago to a guy making a living to an artist buying the stone and carving it. And so it, it just has a wonderful history that you can just see right here. This stone here is an actual volcanic column. This literally was infused and solidified underground and then exposed later. This comes from eastern Washington. This is a basalt. It's an extremely dense stone. If this was a small piece and I was making an indoor piece, I could take this up to like 9,000 grit. It would look like a jewel. This stone can be carved beautifully. Since an outdoor piece, I only take it up to about 300 grit, which is the smoothness you're seeing here. There's no reason to go any more, any finer with the winds that blow here. Again, this is an extremely dense stone. This will look like this 20,000 years from now. So I can imagine, you know, long after our hunters have gone, this thing pops up again out of the ground and lizards climbing all over this thing. You know, hopefully there'll be humans around to think about it, but I'm a little skeptical, but lizards will be climbing on this. You know, maybe some shrew-like mammals, the next human beings might be living underneath it at that point. All right, <clears throat> this is a piece of Aphrodite marble. It comes from a very obscure quarry in the, some islands off Alaska. It's called Aphrodite marble because of the fossils in it. These are clamshells. You know, Venus on the half shell is Aphrodite there. And so this stone is 400 million years old. At that time, we were mud skippers. We were living in the water. Land animals at that point were mainly insects and some plants. These things are old. You know, I bought this stone to carve, and it's a very expensive rock here. You know, it's a thousand bucks just for this rock. But, you know, as I, I looked at it and lived with it, I'm thinking, do I have the hubris to take my grinders to a 400 million year old fossil? It's mine, I can do what I want, but we're really stewards. We don't own anything. We're caretakers. And I can't improve on this. 400 million years old, this is the exterior surface here. It's a beautiful stone. Now, what am I going to do with this? I'm too invested in it and not do anything, you know. I, I own a lot of expensive rocks that I'm not going to carve. But So it had the saw face here and here. And so I decided to ball relief the saw face and call it a sculpture. Now this particular stone has a pin in it and so does this piece of basalt column. So this is actually the base for this. Now I have these boards here in case I want to lift it up, I can get the straps under it. So I actually envision this in somebody's garden as a bench. In a town called Villahermosa in southern Mexico, there's a park called Parque La Venta where the Mexican government has collected all the Olmec heads from the jungle areas to protect them. Because out in the jungle, people rob them, steal them, deface them. And you know, I've been there several times in my life. First time as a young man, maybe 20 or something, and then since then a couple of more times. But that first time I was there, I was looking at a sculpture a little bit bigger than this rock. And, you know, it was made out of basalt, probably, and, you know, it showed several thousand years. I think it was 3,000 years old. But I was sitting there thinking about this sculpture. And, you know, the people or men or men who 
carved it. It's probably men because it's hard work, especially back in those days when you don't have grinders like I'm using. And, you know, having a discussion with a guy who's 3,000 years dead, whose name I couldn't pronounce, and we certainly don't share a common language or heritage, but we're humans. So I had this discussion throughout time. And this was my first big stone that I carved. You know, it was a real learning experience. I ruined a lot of tools on this thing because I was way underpowered. So I'd be grinding and working on this and my grinder would catch on fire. And, and you know, it's, it's very roughly carved. And it isn't now how I would approach it. But of all of my art pieces, this one is kind of personally significant for me because it symbolizes why I got into making stones, carving stones. and the tile work. I've always been doing ceramics and appreciating the longevity of ceramics. They're extremely archival. This is very archival. It'll take atomic bomb to get rid of this stone here. And, you know, again, the same imagery that I'm using in it, you know, these tribal faces, sexual imagery on them. And as you can compare this stone to the one we're going to look at next, you can see my growth as a carver. If you're looking at this piece, you can see just how much more sophisticated the carving is, how much more controlled, how much more developed the imagery is. And this again is basalt like the one we saw earlier. You're looking at something that's going to look like this 20,000 years from now, unless it ends up in a river. This is the exterior surface of the piece. It's hard to carve these rocks because they're so cool just as they are. But this made a great headdress. The one thing about sculpture, and what's a limit about the way I had these pads made, is they're to the side. Sculpture are around. They're done on all the sides here. And please indulge yourself and walk around this sculpture and take a look, because remember, sculptures are three-dimensional. You walk around them. And in my space here, you can climb them. These big guys are pinned to the pedestals. And I've had kids and other people actually climb up on top of them. This is another piece of Aphrodite marble. That's the 400 million year old marble. This is, again, fossil rich. And just to remind you, this is when we're mud skippers. We're living in the shores. And, you know, one thing, I've, and I've thought about these mud skippers. It had to be a girl mud skipper that climbed out of the water. Because, you know, you can imagine all the guys looking at Billy Joe who climbed up out onto the shore and saying, God damn it, what's she doing out there? And they climb out after her, and hence we get land animals. I don't think a man would deliberately go out in where there's no air to breathe. So these are old. And, you know, us as an animal, we were literally a fish back then. Again, I had the same problem, you know, as a steward. What do I do? Do I carve out these clamshells? I don't think so. So again, I had saw cuts, and so I carved the saw cuts. Okay, these two stones, as with many others in the yard, are just chunks of basalt. And I, I bought a lot of these when I bought these. Very, very heavy, very dense. You know, you're looking at probably 600 pounds. Very hard to move. But you got two different carving techniques here. You know, this is kind of the way I normally carve, where I dig into it and shape things. Here I said, you know, I'm going to make this like rock art and just take my grinder and draw. So, you know, the surface is scored. Rock art's thousands of years old. You know, so this will last a long time. However, it won't last like this one where I've actually carved into the rocks. But it's a very different approach and I really like it. So I may do a lot more like this in the future. This is a piece of Ballarat marble. Ballarat is about 50 miles or so north of Trona, California. There's a ghost town there and a collecting site for this beautiful marble here. Now, I didn't actually collect this piece, nor the one below it. I bought this from a buddy. I bought this from a dealer. And, you know, it has this beautiful surface texture. So, you know, the same question that I've been bringing up, we're stewards here. Do I carve out this thing? I don't think so. So, 
I just ball relief the surface cut there and took it back down to the yard where I buy stones and had them pin it for me so I have this kind of ET character. Surprisingly, this is one of the most popular sculptures in my yard. People really like this piece. This stone here I purchased first before I purchased my big pieces of Aphrodite marble. Again, extremely fossil rich. And then here was the saw cut. And so I'm looking at this thing and a stone like this still costs you many hundreds of dollars just for the small piece. So I, what I did is I just polished the saw cut. What you do is you saw it around and bust it off and it leaves this and then normally you smooth it out later. But I just left that, smoothed this out. But again, you can see all of the rich fossil material in here. And this is, this is one of my favorite pieces. Earlier on in the tour, we talked about some pieces I said were Kansas fence posts. That's what you're looking at right here. These are actual fence posts that were used in Kansas. They started quarrying these in about 1870 through about World War II. In Kansas, there is a layer of limestone approximately this wide throughout the whole state. So they quarry this thing out and Back in the 1870s, they sold these for 25 cents each. Now I paid nearly five or six hundred dollars for each of these now. They're fun to carve, but again, they bring out the dilemma that I've been talking about as an artist. And these are remnants of when this actually had barbed wire going across it. These are the nails that they put into this stone to hold the wire. Here are the cuts that the wire had over the years and the stone. Here's the actual little remnant of some wire. The second problem with these things, and if you look down here, they're full of fossils. These are limestone. Limestone's created by shells being compacted in a layer. So you've got ancient history when Kansas was under the ocean, cowboy days, and now I own it. And I've carved several tall ones like this. They're in collector's collections. But again, you know, what I ended up finally doing, and I, I probably won't carve these, is I would just go put circles around everything I couldn't touch. And then I'd carve around that. But, you know, these are just so cool as they are. To make the problems even worse with these Kansas fence posts, Okay, you can see all the hardware from when this was actually used as a fence post in Kansas. That's pretty cool in itself, you know, how many people actually have a fence post from Kansas. And then this is fossil rich, which, you know, you'd have to come up closer to see this. But you can see this brown stain, kind of greenish brown stain. This has another problem. This is a hundred year old forest of moths. So. Again, you know, when this gets wet and it's moist, this will come alive and they'll do whatever moths do. Not only do I have to destroy fossils and history, I have to kill a forest to carve this. It's complicated being an artist. <laughs> My little comfy bench. Be fucked, all that.